talked and communicated a bunch over right. the years, right. especially in the last five years. I think we would all, I, I think both of us always sort of made a point one or the other yeah, to say, like, yeah, say one. what's up or, or, you know, happy holidays or something like that, that you know? Happens. So, um, yeah, it's kind of a trip to finally meet now in that 2017. Happens. But one thing that I know that we do have in common is that we're both originally from Virginia. Okay. So I'd love to start with that, if that's cool okay. with you. Sure. Yeah. I don't know how often. Do you go back at all, or do you get back at all? Um, I do every couple of months. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah, so yeah. pretty pretty regularly yeah. then. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's the same for me. Yes. What part? What part of Virginia? This is Blacksburg. Okay, right, right. Yeah. Yes, yes. And you're from, from Richmond, right? Richmond, yes. Yeah. Yes. So not far at all. Definitely. Yeah. So and I've been to Richmond a lot a right. bunch of so Blacksburg year. is um is it JMU that in that area? No, it's Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech? Yeah. So more well, south? Yeah, south it's southwest. It's okay. um uh let's see. What's the drive from Richmond to Blacksburg? Three and a half hours, something like that. Mm. Um it's kind of right it nestled between the border or close to the border west virginia to tennessee and north okay. carolina it's in that that right. last little triangle right. getting right. getting close to like bristol and like okay. the border and all Excellent. that stuff like that yeah cattle on a thousand hills down there when you're traveling <laughs> that highway yeah you know yeah. what i mean when i said that <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh but you basically spent like you grew up there and then when you moved here you are already like in your twenty early twenties, right? Or I was actually um I think it was actually nineteen wow. when I moved and then but I was Did turning twenty within, you know, like a month or so. Uh we I had just finished uh, my second year at uh Virginia Commonwealth University. Yes, at VCU. Right, yeah. correctly. Uh, I love it, I love it as the the theme goes. <laughs> and um and That's was, the theme for VCU? Yes, yeah, VCU. I love it. It's like the pep rally chant. Right, right. Something, something like that. And um, mm-hmm. then we got signed to, uh, it was a group down south. Right. We got so signed. I'd like to talk to him about. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. And we got signed by uh, Stretch uh, Armstrong. He was a um, A&R at Big Beat at the time. Yes. So Big Beat Atlantic. And uh, Bobito was actually the one who brought us to, you know, they had the show together. Of course. So, I know it well. Yeah. yeah. I helped, When they did their, the big, um, sort of promotional push the initial one for the movie right um i helped uh worked as a booking agent to kind of for the sort of live combo screening plus dj okay. set thing so and i had put on we had done some stuff over the years leading up to that film too it's funny because just in case i reached out to bobito before we talked mm-hmm. um just to be because i knew i didn't know exactly the finer points of of you know you're you getting signed to Big Beat right. or or anything like that, and I was just trying to get some context because uh, I couldn't get a hold of Stretch. So, um, and he had said, uh, well, one there was a demo called Lyrica Tessin. Do you remember yeah, that? Was, that was a song on um, on a particular demo. It was you know it was a couple of things on it. It's interesting enough. Um, I was going through iTunes, you know, I have Apple Music, and I came across a Quincy Jones um, album. I forgot the name of it, but basically he's on an album cover with like this green shirt. You know, it's probably right. green screen, you know, uh, cropped out of whatever. And the song is on it, and, and I sent it to Mayor and Jeremy, who were the other right. members of the group. This was a, a couple of months ago. And I say, remember this? And then, so that was that was the main part of the lyric contestant. You know? Is it really? Because yeah. no one's ever, obviously, no one, I try to look it up. It doesn't no, no, exist no, 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 anywhere. No, 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 right. Pure demo. Right, right. Pure demo. But what else was on that? Do you remember? Um, Big Wheels, I think that made the album, uh-huh. and some others. I can't. It, it was a number of things, you know. Right. But but that was the one that to this day. I mean, obviously he mentioned it to you, but right. but I guess that was obviously Bobito's probably the one that was more. You know, it stood out for him. Or yeah, he clearly remembered it and yeah. typed it out and everything. Yeah, you know, yeah. so um, yeah. I mean, I guess so. I mean, we can kind of jump into it, but I, I sort of wanted to get a little bit of context for growing up in Virginia too and how really how the group even came to be because if it really wasn't I guess for that group too you probably wouldn't have come to New York and then even sort of started that journey that part of your uh your life in New York uh, as a producer too um so did you grow up with those guys like did you know them from like from school high school or middle school or something um uh the MC so it was Soda Pop um Jeremy he's actually my cousin Oh, okay. So, right, so we cool. grew up together. Not necessarily rapping. I was, you know, it was interesting because each of us had 
our specific thing that we did. I was the one who was always into, let's say, you know, rapping and production and whatever like that. And Mayor, the DJ, I met him. Well, I go to Jeremy. Jeremy, um, my cousin, he was into sports and all kinds of stuff like that. So we started uh, a group when we went to, right, I guess around the VCU time. So, and I had met Mayor, who's a DJ in high school. He actually had um, come down. You know, at some point from New York, and his mother was in there. You know, they lived. So he was a native New Yorker originally. Correct, right? okay. correct. And then moved down there, um, and then we ended up going to school together. So that's how he and I connected, and then the three of us, you know, came together from that point. So, so you guys had already, your cousin and you had already sort of batted some ideas yeah. around as far as doing messing around with music and stuff. Correct, and we were in a group um, uh, with. Uh, uh, Trey, uh, Big Herb, and uh, Nikki. It was a, you know, so with that group, uh, it was called the J Team. You know, nice. so that, that was initially, and then from that point, Mayor and I would, you know, I knew he DJ, so it was from that point, you know, we just mess around, but it wasn't a group type scenario. And right, right. As we progressed, we all went were into college. Then that's when the group started to come together. So what is this? Because the the album came out in ninety three or two. Uh, we got signed in ninety two. So that means it came out about 95. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Right. So this, even this very early phase, I mean, is what, 90 or something like that? Or? 90, yeah, because I was in college in 90 at um, the year of 90. We graduated in 1990. So, yeah, it was 91, budding, you know. Right. We were doing all the scenes. We went to, went to Atlanta a couple of times, had shows. Oh, and, cool. Okay. You know, different things like that. And then because Mayor would travel back and forth between New York, his family was from here. He knew Bobito uh, because one of his family members worked uh, with Russell Simmons. Mm. So, you know, in the intern, he was doing an internship or working in something right. or whatever. So that's how the demo got to Bobito because Mayor, you know, obviously working at uh, Def Jam and any of those companies, you know, let him hear it and then, you know, right. it went from there. So, Did you guys have a presence in Richmond, like, to speak of at that time or in Virginia? Like, would you get out and were you – Performing that demo and stuff? Or? A little bit uh, at the VCU. You know, just yeah. a little. But we never really had, um, you know, like people spend, you know, years building up a local presence. Right. I mean, we were, um, you know, in the college scene a little bit. But right. we were just, we were fortunate to get a deal that fast as, you know, in the group coming together with the three yeah. of us. I mean, we were together, I mean, maybe a year and a half, maybe something roughly. Wow. And, but obviously it, it comes with connections too and obviously you know we have to you know produce the music that will make someone want you know like it to whatever degree yeah but, it's got to be compelling enough yeah. to get to the point of being able to put correct like, release it right? correct correct yeah um had you i mean growing up were you playing instruments i mean were you i mean how did it even get up to that point because obviously you would then start later as far as a producer you would play more and more right. instruments so right. was it that like you had even started that Young, were you playing? Oh, definitely in the young. band. Um, initially, I started out playing uh, saxophone in elementary school, so I think maybe fifth grade. Oh, nice! And I went through, let's say, the ninth grade. But you know, I didn't practice. And I, you know, it's right, one right. of those things. It's just. But production. Uh, my uncle took another cousin and I, who was separate group, who I rapped with him. So I basically, I end up. I was rapping and doing with different little pockets of different right. people. You know, since I was since elementary school, like the the, the I remember my uncle uh, took my other cousin and I to a New York City Fresh Fest concert. Nice. Oh, they, you guys drove up from Virginia to New York? No, no, no. Oh, it, it was, was it, came it was down. called New York City Fresh Fest. Right. It was at the local Coliseum. So I remember he took us to the um, to the event, which is old uh, VW Beetle. You know what I mean? And just, <laughs> nice. You know, and I I just you know obviously we had listened to hip hop prior to that point, but I just remember like wow man I just so sure. fell in love even more with you know the culture and stuff and from that point you know that's when i was um what, what was i called shawnee J. so shawnee J. yeah yeah nice. you know and then eventually you know it, it the name progressed over the years or right, like right. That. but um yeah man it, it was it, it was awesome and it, just even to think back on it because you don't always think back on it yes you know, yeah i mean time. especially that period of time just like in music in general and your, whatever your first like real major concerts are going to be they're going to make such a big impression on right, you right. and um i mean i mean in blackberry there was no 
major hip hop, the only hip hop that would come there would be at Virginia Tech, at right, the okay. university. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, to have, so the Fresh Fest was in, it came to what, came to Richmond or did Richmond, you go? Yeah, it was yeah. Richmond, yeah. So what was it, Houdini or something? Oh or? man, it was, that Fat Boys was the, they were the headliners. Um, Amazing. David DMX, I think. Uh, nice. Can't quite remember. That, that, that's but the fat boys definitely were the headliners, stuff. yeah. And who were you know huge, yeah, huge pop design. stars definitely. at that point in time, definitely. um, yeah, that's cool, yeah. I'm just trying to get context because there isn't a lot of info about mm-hmm. down south, too. I mean, it was also, it's just, I mean, you guys had just done the one album, too, right, right, right. and it's from a period of time when we just had print media to really go off mm-hmm. of, so um, there's not like a ton to dig into as far as an right. archive, right. and then of course, there's the you know the music video, which I think is what really introduced you guys to right. something. That's how I first heard you guys. So, where do you think that video was filmed? Well, I'd like to think it was filmed in Virginia. Oh, uh, yeah. absolutely! <laughs> yeah. We were already in New York, so so what? Uh, Jersey somewhere? Oh, uh, uh, Prospect Coyland, Park, Van Cortland Park. Uh, yes. I think in the Bronx, you know. In the Bronx yeah. too. Wow. Okay. And then, and then the um, I think it was a scene with a White House and like the whole fixing the cornbread. Oh, that right. was actually in Prospect Park. No it's way. This White House that's. Right off, I think, right off of Flatbush, so. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. Because, I mean, the way it was stylized and the mm-hmm. color scheme, you know, it had like those fall kind of oranges. Yeah. And, like, you would I'm think. I'm sorry, I don't remember the director's name now, but he was a gentleman from California. I remember, you know, it's going through the treatment and all that stuff. Right. So, so it was good. We had, we had a great time with that. You know? Yeah, I would think that, like, it being such a. I mean, did it feel like it was a quick experience? Like, uh, from you guys just you know doing making a demo and doing some s- stuff a little bit of stuff and it only really being a year and then going coming to New York and it being like a proper I, you know major label treatment in a way you know yeah it, the interesting thing I mean coming from once we got signed you know actually moved which was 92 right after we got out of school and so let's say May and then um we we were fine in the beginning, but then once you start getting, you know, you're getting used to New York. My, you're already new in New York, you know, and that's why the album ultimately became Lost in Brooklyn because it was down south, but then out more myself and Jeremy's experience in this whole understanding New York. Where did you live at? Uh, in Clinton Hill. Okay. And we actually lived a street over from Biggie. So that was interesting. Right when we were coming to Biggie was getting signed and everything like that. So he was still around the neighborhood, he was, too. Literally. I remember, you know, he was the biggest guy on the block, you know what I mean, clearly, and had his guys around him. It was, I mean, he's a very, wow. you know, he stood out easily. Yeah, you know? yeah, absolutely. He was still on the block. And, and, wow, you know, that's his a transition. Trip. So you were, but you lived in, did you live there for quite a while in that same we did, place? We did. Yeah. yeah, we did. So, uh, but in the process of recording, you know, we were introduced uh, for the album to like the Beat Nuts and right. T Ray right. stretched it, uh, some things on there. You know, I ended up doing a lot of production. I didn't, in my mind, I didn't come to New York to produce. I came to be a star, you know? And I remember right. hearing, you know, Diamond D uh, when he rhymed on a tribe's, um, uh, what was that? Check was the on, rhyme. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The. On Low End Theory. Low End Theory, that's what I meant, sorry. Um, and uh, he. He was talking about how, you know, you know, wanted me to make a couple of G's. Like, he was talking about producing, and I'm thinking right. in my mind, oh, okay, that's fine. That sounds pretty yeah. good. But Stretch and uh, Reef, um, Rob Reef Too Low, he was the a as well. Right. So, that big beat. They were the ones who really encouraged me to really go hard at the production. Really? Okay. Know? And maybe they saw, you know, obviously, you know, uh, rap-wise, you know, I was decent, but they saw something in me. And that happened to me in another point earlier on with uh, some people who were trying to manage me years ago in Richmond saw that. You know, I mean, oftentimes you need encouragement and things that maybe Absolutely. that, you know, that you just don't realize. Yeah, but, for sure. Yeah, You know, but um, so in working with, let's say, the Beat Nuts and T-Ray, a lot of those guys took us under their wings, you know, um, because, you know, just learning from them. And it, it was a great experience. But then the album took a little long and then you start to get into, well, you know, I think Arrested Development was out there. So it was kind of, that's, so we were kind of in that same vein. And and we almost lost way in the album where it was like, you know, well, how, how what are we going to do? You know what I mean? Kind of, right. you know, it was just the, the struggle trying to create identity 
when you had such, you know, I mean, you had Snoop out at the time, you had the Black Sheep, you had all these different people, you know, and music then, I mean, every it was so many prolific, you know, groups and um, just regular artists and yeah, stuff so like that. Yeah, so many personalities at yeah. that time, you know. Yeah, and, and, it, and it was, I mean, from the um, art, um, Artifacts and, you know, right. uh, Leaders of New School. And, and I remember when the Artifacts got signed to the label, you know, because they were signed to Big Beat along with us. Sure. You know, the, the the thing with a label is, you know, when you get signed, you have certain people there who, you know, obviously feel you in a certain way or whatever, but then, you know, maybe the staffing changes or whatever, and then all the new kind of group come in, and, right. you know, and, and we just struggle for midway through that album just to, you know, figure out who we were, you know what I mean? And we ultimately found that way through it, you know, but... Midway through the production of the album? Yeah, okay. yeah through the production, right. yeah, so... But the mood, it wasn't just some smooth transition. Like, okay, you get signed, and then you have to deal with the making of an album and, you know, in studio. And we did a lot of the work, but like I said, midway through, we just kind of lost that way, and we had to regain it. You had know? you worked out of, like, a big studio before, like, before this? So even no. that studio experience is a new thing. That can be overwhelming in itself, I would think. Oh, uh, definitely, right? definitely. And one thing they did, which was great, when we first came, they put us in... Um, the studio called Firehouse. Um, mm, where so was that? In Brooklyn. It was actually right off Court Street. Um, the, the guy who owned the name was Urim. Mm. And uh, Das Effects, I think, recorded there and some different people. That, right, you know, when they, the popular, I mean, that's actually really where they recorded. Right. And so it was good to have that in the barrel we, that we were in and kind of, you know, just workshop a lot. So it was really, really cool. Urim was really cool and um, the assistants and stuff. And then eventually we moved to Manhattan, uh, recording at like uh, I think um, was it a soundtrack? Yeah, I think it's Soundtrack Studios, and you know some different places. But it 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 was a, it was a process for us, you know what I mean? And obviously budgets flow then, and everybody you know right. eating off your budget, and you know it, right, it was right. just we all these, these nice guys and like yeah yeah come. On. I just remember you know doing a session. It was man, we looked up, everybody's eating off the budget. And looking around, like, we barely even know these guys, you know what right. I mean? It's just, you know, but, you know, that's what it was, and, and um, we learned a lot. We learned a lot. I would a certainly lot. think it sounds like yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, you're coming from Virginia, it's New York, mm-hmm. it's a totally different speed, a different cast of characters involved with everything. Definitely. Definitely. Um, but, I mean, after, you know, this this record, like, in that experience, I mean, it seemed that that was probably two years of your life in New York during that that whole thing, right? I would say three. Ultimately, by the time it was it was released, right. You know, so, um, we went through a lot, man. How did you feel? Like, what was the? Where were you at right a- afterwards? I mean, obviously, every album has its campaign and its that time way. to like rise, and then it you know yeah. fades out a little bit. Like, what? So, what? Where does that leave you at that point in time in your okay. life? Too? Yeah. Um, once we went through the process, we did the video as we talked about. Uh, album was released. You know, it did okay, you know, but um, understanding now, or really then, too, how the whole label system works. You know, a lot of groups get signed, and, you know, the ones that pop, stay. The ones that don't, they, right. you know, get dropped or whatever like that. But it, it went through, I would say, depression, you know, but it was, yeah, I mean, it was a depressing time. Because it felt like hmm. you came to New York to live this dream, and, you know, this entity gave you value there and literally put money up and also, you know, believed in you enough to say, come do this. Right. And then you spend this time, you know, these years working on that particular piece and, you know, work with them only to find yourself released, which happens to, you know, all artists ultimately. You yeah. Know? And, but being young and not understand, you know, it, it took a lot out of us, you know, and it even caused some, a little turmoil in the group. Just, you know, we were all trying to figure it out, you know, right, right. but then from that point, um, I was about to go, and I was just like, you know, my dad was like, well, you know, you're up there now, you know, you know, you get a job at the post office, something like that. So I was literally about to go and and I actually had gone to the post office, and I, wow. you know, was about to, you know, fill in the application, and I was just praying. I was like, God, you know, I just, you know, I, I just, I didn't want to do it, man. I was just like, I need, you know, I, I felt like it, I would, I would have been a failure having worked it, you know, like gone from that to just well, to yeah. go get a day job. It's a you know pretty I mean? dramatic yeah, change. Yeah, 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 change. So, but ultimately, um, through the relationships with the label, 
uh, Mad Skills had just gotten signed to Big League. That's right. So, and Mad Skills is from Richmond. I never knew him when he was there. So, you didn't know him prior no, at all? No, not Amazing. At all. Not at all. But, obviously, through the connection with the label. So, we're there, and I'm like, man, you know. And then I submitted some music to Rob, uh, Reef, you know, who was the, you know, A&R stretch up. Right. I think he was A&R then, but it was Rob. And, you know, Mad Skills ended up picking three. And, obviously, the advances and everything worked out and I, and it kept me from working in a post office you right. know what I mean yeah. and then I went on to do some stuff with like uh, Vinny and Mojica and you know um, the uh, Artifacts you did, know, the Vinia, did the Vinia stuff ever never see the out. day it never came out she's such a, there's such a shroud of mystery around her career I feel mm-hmm. like because there was like you know uh, De La and mm-hmm. then even Geology had an mm-hmm. amazing song with her mm-hmm. Yield Junkie and and I think even Tribe or Q-Tip mm-hmm. did but never, um, and Pete Rock did too. So, like, have these really amazing producers mm-hmm. doing work. I mean, yourself included, obviously. I, I didn't know that you guys yeah, had done something. Um, was it for, like, an album or something? Do you remember? So, what well, that I was? think she was signed to Warner, if I remember correctly. Um, and it was supposed to be, you know, for yeah. an album. And she was working on it. And I know that she was going through a spiritual journey too. I'm not sure, mm. you know, the, the full extent of it. But, uh, you know, it, it just, looking back, I mean, you can see... You know, if you don't meet certain criteria for whoever, you know, and it could be you could be amazing. But if the staff changes or if just the, the trend changes, all it takes is one or two groups to come out and change the direction music is going. And be, and, you know, record companies, obviously, there it's a business. Right. And they see that, you know, OK, well, the business trend that's going to keep the lights on and everyone stockholders happy and everything else is going uh, this way. Right. It just it's the nature of it, you know what I mean? So I'm not sure of the, the deep details. Yeah, but, sure. You know. But no, that's I mean yeah. it's so funny how um or maybe not funny, it's kinda of more heartbreaking that really how many great artists have been um uh, you know, their career has been compromised simply because a new staff had comes in or like uh you know, a couple different people are let off from the job and like it's just a new regime comes in. And then um, that whoever the new people that are in place are totally unfamiliar with the with the current roster, and right. it's like, yeah, we're gonna, uh, you know, we're dropping everybody right. and starting over, and you know, we're only gonna be signing, you know, this style of artist now, you know, right. like that's such a a common thing that you know, I guess the the public doesn't really it doesn't register mm-hmm. with them because they're not thinking on those terms, mm-hmm. but and you look at it from a business standpoint, if you have you sign 10 artists and two just uh, do amazingly well platinum selling and all this stuff right. you know the artists that were you know um, you spent the money on become write offs to that I mean from a pure business mm-hmm. standpoint it becomes losses to the company and fortunately right. the way they work it you know that none of us had to pay that money back it was like you know it was almost like an investment they made a, a lost investment you know right? they didn't like say oh well you spent X amount. It may have been some people may have had to pay it back, but I I know not many at all who right. you know it's just, it becomes a loss on investment. You know, right, right. So, They're investing in multiple groups at the right, same time right. and hoping that if one of them really pops off, it yeah. covers the whole uh, investment probably. Um, yeah. So I mean, that, so so what happens to to down south at this period of time? Is it just like, hey, you know, I'm gonna obviously I got to. St- we all have to find some line of work here. I'm going to just stick to my production. And like, what was, we were still living in the same house and that's, we we started, um, particularly, I don't know how it really happened, man. I mean, it was just, we started losing that way. And particularly I started, when I started doing more production, um, Jeremy and Mayor, they were, you know, still hanging. I think they started working a little bit and, you know, different jobs or whatever like that. And I think uh, Mayor went back to doing the Def Jam Rush thing right. or whatever. Jeremy had t- taken the job, and I was doing the production. But our relationship, you know, was they were they were fine. It was just, you know, with me, it was just, you know, it was it was it was tension to a degree. It wasn't, you know, like fighting. Did you ever think way. about trying to do? Did you ever talk about doing another record at, in that moment? Obviously, no, you no, know, it was a lot. We, we talked a little bit about it, but it was still. And I think too, at that point, I probably was so. Happy, I'm doing my production, and I was just happy with doing it. That right. I didn't per se want to do it. You right, know what right. I mean? So, um, 
and maybe they did. You know, I think maybe so. But, you know, everybody just start going their own way, you know. And, I mean, you obviously got, like, really busy, like, by 96 and 97. Right. I mean, the because that there's this, like, giant bulk of production work uh, mm-hmm. that, was, that you had um, all during that period. So, obviously, it's, like, got to be tricky to even negotiate that time with yourself but are you bouncing from project to project that whole time or definitely it was just you know freelancing um just freelance producer but the great thing that i think lack is lacking now it was community based you know where right. you would just is organically you'll go to a studio and that's the that's the thing just for the fact that studios closing people don't realize how studios were like the hub of a lot of connective tissue that brought different people together you know i met most deaf in a studio i was work he um i was working with the bush babies right and mr man obviously brought him in to do he did the intro and outro on a beat that's right hit, yeah you know um this is bush baby's second record yeah uh, gravity. gravity yeah right. and you know so from that place it was like you know and then i was like 88 keys and you know you come to the studio and then you know work would come like it, it was just like everybody would come we would come to each other's sessions and just you know to support each other you know as friends the geologies and all these different people right. and work would come out of, of it for those people you know right. which is great you know yeah. geology had a great story in our conversation where about body rock because mm-hmm. it was during the session the actual recording session that you were doing for Body Rock that he came to hang out. I think he even was helping you bring in some equipment, some gear mm-hmm. into the studio. This yeah. is his story. Yeah. And um, and uh, the guys from Rockus were there. I think Jared or Brian or one of the two right. or both of them were in the studio right. at that moment. He had his portfolio right. there. They looked through the portfolio and they're right. like, yo, you need to do the, the do you want to do the sing- the artwork for right. this? Because right. this is going right. to be a, a, it's a single, right. you know. And we even talked about like the whole creation of that body rock artwork too, which, as a companion to the music, is pretty right. is pretty amazing, right? You know, yeah, so, he's amazing as an artist. I mean, his you know incredible, yeah, nothing like it. I mean, just the stuff and the, you know the stuff with him and Matt Dew too was just uh, mm-hmm. an amazing uh, example of of really that all those great characters in, in New York at that mm-hmm. time too. I feel like both producers and artists and you know personalities and stuff I mean like just to bring it back to the ultimate way you want but I want to speak about geology I mean I met geology at you know same in an organic way he was at a studio um, I think at um, uh, was, uh, what what you know and you yes know, Gene what, Gray yeah Gene Gray you know what what at the time but that whole group and you know met him but then geology you know sometime later he played me in his song that he did with consequence this was after the fact you know but I, I still periodically think about it. that was one of the most amazing songs I've ever heard really with consequence you know? yes yeah. oh my goodness I was like Oof. and I, I don't I don't know if it ever was released hmm. or whatever you know I wonder yeah. yeah but I mean consequences you know I worked with him through Matt Fingers with Guess Wild yes you know, I would like to talk about I yeah, want yeah. to talk about that era too okay okay um, so. yeah uh, he, you know another funny thing from geology too was he told me even before we started recording our conversation was um, because I had mentioned you um, that uh, I guess you guys all had gone on like a a road trip record buying road trip with you and 88 keys and maybe some other people, but talking about Virginia and like how you guys went back, I think to your, your folks house or something like that. Do you remember that? Yes, absolutely. And my parents remember that. My my parents love those guys to to this day. (laughs) They're like, whatever happened to those guys? Yeah. They, they remember them, you know, by name too. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Well, we went to um, this uh, the Plan Nine Records in Richmond. Yes, and yeah. When I mean, they had like a, I guess a street fair, but they would do a records. Man, the records were like five cents a piece, something crazy. Wow. They would just clean, but we we everybody came back with boxes and boxes. And wow. Records, you know? So it was great. You know? Yeah, Plan Nine. Yeah, it's a classic. That was a classic spot in Richmond. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and then another thing we talked about too was that you had you also had a, a studio space in in your in your Fort Greene place, mm-hmm. right? Like you were, right. was that something where were you just uh, demoing stuff out and then you'd outsource it to a larger studio or what? Because at this time, this is like this is the beginning of you and most stuff really working together too, Correct. right? Right. So can you speak on that a little bit? Um, we definitely it was definitely you know the demoing side. Of, you know we didn't do any. Um, 
thing that was actually released out of there. It was definitely, you know, a workshop and everything, and then go. It's like a home, classic home studio setup. Yeah, correct, yeah. correct. And 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 also too, it was really before the advent of like a lot of the Pro Tools and stuff. So got you know. They weren't expecting you to do much recording there. They expect you to come to the studio ready to do right. what they bring you to do, which is perform, you know, whatever you're doing. But um, Mr. Man uh, brought most, I guess, in, in, in speaking to Miss, Mr. Man recently, most had asked, it was after we had worked together for the Gravity album in, at Battery Studios, he asked uh, for him to bring him to my house. Mm -hmm. So then from that point, we connected and, um, you know, we started working, you know, and then... You know, Khalil was off doing whatever he, you know, he was doing, and then we started just, you know, he listening to tracks, and he would, he, I mean, he was always come and sing, and just, you know, most the one thing about him, at you play something, he's gonna rap or sing, you know, I'm not right. surprised he do, does as much singing, he just constantly did it. Right. He would sit down. This was when he was growing as an actor, and you know, had an agent and all this stuff, and he would just sit down and read magazines, and I would record him just doing like, well, let's see. Um, this water, blah, 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 blah. you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It, it's just fun. Right. We just have fun with it. You know what I mean? So um, he's but. got range. I mean, you know, uh, obviously his his artistry is a very particular place right now. Mm -hmm. You know, um, at that moment, yeah, it's like it, he seemed so very prolific at that mm -hmm. time because he had the, that Cosby show, the Cosby Definitely. mystery Definitely. show. He Definitely. and and Medina Green was still like had you know their thing all before. Black Star and, and right. Black on both sides, you know. Um, and fascinating with that, and then I'll be, um, speaking to Khalil or Mr. Man. I yes, because yeah, he did play such a big role in that. Too. Dude, I did not realize how, when we're talking about connective tissue, Khalil is very pivotal. I mean, obviously he introduced uh, Mosa and I to each other, but I found out that he introduced uh, Quali and Mose. Oh wow! I didn't know. You know I didn't he went know to that. school with both of them, right? And I think uh, Fortify Live is that yep. correct? That was that first uh, yeah. single reflection. That's how they met. You know what I mean? He knew oh, each wow. of them separately. You know, so when you think about that, I mean, you you and and Khalil has such a big heart, man. I mean, it's like when you think, I mean, you really look at that. God, this was reflected on it recently. Like, you know, sometimes people would have certain people that won't kind of hold these people okay this is my friend over here and this is my friend but never right. put the, constantly put people together and i mean he i can't he's done that for countless people you know mm. and i mean i appreciate him so much man because when you really think about it you know his those things affect you know history to the point where i saw a picture with quali uh at the black history museum right in dc right. standing next to the black star record you know with I think Nina Simone, so it's you know wherever have it, they had a position, and it's amazing, you know what I mean, that the group, if Khalil, Mr. Man, had not right. even introduced them, you know what I mean, mm. that piece of hit that would that would not exist on right. the wall, and you it know? was as simple as just like yeah, you gotta meet yeah. meet my friend, man. and let's do a song together, and then they, right. you know what I mean, it was right. awesome, you know. How did you guys meet Mr. Man and you? Was it just a uh, how did met that through met through um. Uh, young lady Joey, she was out the down south. She was the road manager. Oh yeah. And then she worked at um, a business agent, and I think the business agent represented the Bush Babies. So she was, you know, um, she, you know, she introduced me, and then you know we grew from there. So yeah, right. thanks to her too, obviously. Right. Because then course, she introduced yeah. me to Khalil. You know what I mean? It's yeah. There's always someone has to introduce yeah, you yes, to somebody. Yes, 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 you yes, know. Yes. Um, yeah, because that was yeah that obviously was like that Bush Babies album definitely did, uh, you know, sort of set it off in a few directions. I think even because the Uma was on it as well, if I'm not mistaken, I think. If I'm not mistaken. Or, yeah, let me, on the Bush Baby. Was Maybe. it? Maybe. Um, it was kind of around that time. Right. I'm not I'm not sure. I can't remember the track listing. But I could say the interesting story, too. We were finishing the album, and... It was, I mean, like the last few days, and they were looking for this this final track. You know, mm -hmm. um, Ian was the um, A and R. You know, great great A and R. So they were just looking. You know, and I remember, and I had been with them so long with the album. You know, constantly, and, and that's the great thing. You start working on an album, you just kind of, oh, you can try this and try this and try. Uh -huh. you know? So one of the final nights, I went home and you know I was working on the track and I was playing it, 
and it was this bird that would come outside the basement window, you know, mm. where we were in, in um, Clinton Hill. Every, every, and I was like, man, I'm going to record that bird. You know, because I would do, I would record sounds, and I would do all sure. kinds of stuff, too, and incorporate. So I recorded it, and then I ended up doing the track for Universal Magnetic that to finish that album off. So I brought it back the next day. I was excited. I was like, man, this is it. This is it. And they were like, you know, they liked it. Oh, it's hot, it's hot. But it's not what we're looking for. So wow. they denied it. And that's happened. I'm sure that happens to a lot of people. Sure. You know, but they they didn't want it. And I, you know, okay. And then when most came to the house, he heard it. He was like, oh, I have to have it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it became universal magnetic. Mm. You know what I mean? Wow. Um, so, you know, it's it's amazing, man. You know. What was the, but the whistling of the very, very beginning, that's. That's him. That's most right. in, the, in the studio. We, we recorded at. Skeff Anselm's house. Oh, dope. You know, up in the Bronx, you know, so. What did you do at the very beginning of Body Rock, that time stretch vocal thing? Like, is that, that's your voice, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it's just, um, it's my voice. It's the, it's the singing. Uh, underneath it said, I think, with the, gr- with, the, with the greatest pain, I never meant to hurt you. That's underneath. Oh, but really? I just, I had a dat player, and I just actually, with a dat when you hit it play, and then you just hit reverse. It just will play backwards. So I was playing that line oh, no backwards. Oh wow! Before the track started, I've know? always wondered that. That's yeah, because yeah, it was another kind of like right before the the track really goes into yeah. it. It's just, just a little moment in time, yeah. you know. Um, another joint that I love that you guys did was that Funkmaster Flex uh, mm-hmm. joint. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yes. That shit is. I love that song, man. Like I even went back just before, uh, you know, as I was kind of you know mentally preparing to to sit with you. Just digging through uh, stuff, trying to find some loose joints and stuff, mm-hmm. and yeah, it was just such a, you know, I, man. I've heard that song so long. I don't, I don't even know the name of the song to be honest. Honestly, I think it was just. I think it was titled Freestyle. Right. I think it didn't have a song title, and yeah. really, he only sort of mentions. He like really quickly mentions Funkmaster Fleck. It's right, not like right. it's like the traditional like you know pr- yeah, DJ promo type definitely. of joint. It's more a song with you and him than but, anything. Like. But um, what it was, I think Funk Flex had approached him because he was putting that particular album together right. with a whole bunch of so some of them were full of songs some of them were more like interlude-esque kind of right. songs or whatever so we ended up having one of those and we recorded a spot in uh, Manhattan and you know he just went in and did you know what I mean so it was but that was, that was when both of us were starting to grow you know I was already doing other stuff like the artifacts on that you know did a lot of stuff really that was before most you know the artifact stuff and then that's right doing like the boot camp click stuff and things like that so i was already doing you know growing as a producer he was growing right. as you know this mc and stuff and we still you know came together i mean that artifact so, song that first single the, the actual art of facts yeah. was such a i remember because at that time i was really in college radio at virginia tech although i didn't go to i didn't go to i was still in high school but i finagled my way onto the radio to have a regular okay. show sweet I uh, didn't go to college. I went to college in California a few, some years later. But, uh, you know, that was a big college radio record. Right. But it was such a departure from uh, uh, Between a Rock and a Hard Place. Mm-hmm. All the, you know, that was T Ray and Red Man and Rock right, Wilder right, and like right, these right. really muddy, dirty samples right. and beats. And the vibe was very different. And, and the, you have a, I mean, you are really like the main producer on. Definitely. Uh, that's them, right? right? That's the name of the record. Yeah, about half. I did it, ended up doing about half of the record, and then uh, we did it at Platinum Island and Duro, which I met Duro. Yes. I mean, that's the man. I met Duro through the process too, because he was working there through that particular album. Um, really, it was through through. Yeah, actually, it was because he 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 was the recording engineer initially, and then um, yes, yes. Ken Duro. How do you say his last name? Eiffel. Eiffel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and he. Um, you know, so we were working together and stuff like that on it. So it ended up becoming the the thing was great about him. He would always make your track like the the rough. He, he worked he worked tight like if you like his his um, engineering, which I love his engineering. He always worked hard from the beginning. He wasn't lazy about right. getting the sound. So inadvertently, him helping him giving them the demo and then they hear it just the A and R it just helped even to propel me. You know. Right. With the but obviously I was growing in relationship with them too, and it's just you know I when I get into a project, man, I just like I really like focusing on I like one offs and stuff too, but I really like 
when I could get with an artist and just kind of figure out what side of myself I'm going to do because right. I'm always pushing myself to do with without I don't I don't go too wild swing you know and and but I can do you know say EDM type stuff to you know what whatever and I'm always willing to push my interpretation of a thing you know right. because I may not necessarily be the trap guy but I'm sure I could I could pick the elements apart and give you a version of it that is still a, a facet of my diamond you know what I mean sure so that's why I like really doing um, full full projects right. you know, or working with the artist progressively well this you one know. right here I feel it was one is very slept on but this was definitely oh, man, a yes, great yes, example yes. of that uh, the Wisdom Life album right? yes you remember this one? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yes. He, um, uh, Q. Q is uh, very cool dude. Yeah, I haven't talked to him in some years, but he was, uh, he's a really, really nice human being. Yeah, definitely. And he, um, he was in a group that, uh, Mayor and Jeremy from the group had managed from Richmond. Oh, so no way. I didn't know that. Really. Yeah. And he, um, he's from Virginia. He's from Virginia. Oh, okay. Virginia. Yep. And he, uh, he moved up here. He was staying with us at the house that we were staying at. They, you know, so we eventually, you know, um, grew and then I was he was there when I was producing a lot of stuff and all these you know, know at certain points in time and you know this was opportunities that came uh, from overseas and uh, Ken Hidaka yes Ken Hidaka <laughs> who I yes. met I actually hung out with him in in Japan uh, years ago now wow. but but he was the man at Peavine he, he yeah. Uh, and a lot of those guest wild projects and yeah. um, probably even Beyond Real and some some other stuff but I know he definitely did. A lot of those geology covers are Ken Hidaka records mm, yeah. and stuff. This is awesome. Yeah, geology did this too. Yes, he did. He has the original hanging in his kitchen. It's beautiful. The original mm-hmm. version of it is, for those that might not know this record, it's Wisdom Life uh, had an album called um, um, How My Life Sounds, yeah. which had an awesome song at Jazz Slim, I think was the joint. Yeah, I liked yeah, the most. It was just yeah. like great female vocalists on it too. But that geology actually, had done um, the cover. That, that is... Um, uh, was uh, his girlfriend at the time? Oh yeah, yes, oh great. cool, yeah, nice, yeah, no. Nah, but it, it was it was awesome, man. It was it, the thing was great, man. It was just when we talk about, I mean, organic is used a lot now, but it was, right. I mean, that's really what it was. It was just you know guys getting together, and we were too young to think, to overthink it. You know, right. it was just like you know, hey, I like what you're doing, you know, and we just you just went for it, you know. Now, That's a really like, good point. a little too calculated, right? You know, and you know, while you, people put out way more music now, you know, um, because you know, trying to feed the 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 hunger for content and stuff like that, right? right. You know, this stuff is just you know, it's just awesome because it was just guys, you know, young, just you know, wanted to just do their craft, and you know, it right. was great. Okay. Yeah, thanks for showing it to me. Uh, absolutely, yeah. There's one other one that we're kind of. I have both of these records, but um, do you remember these dudes? Yes, Blind, Blind Mice. Mice. Yes. What was yes. the story with them? Because um, uh, I don't. I mean, I have the two. They obviously. I think MC MCI was the label, a small indie. Mm-hmm. I think it was their, actually. I think it was their label. Yeah, it makes sense. I think that they only put out maybe six or seven records in total. But there's two. You did one called Paper Chase, and I think another one on this one. There's two. I have both of them. Um, just some indie 12 inches from. But I, are these dudes were f- not from New York, were they? Yeah, they were. They, they were, were from um, okay. from I think both from Brooklyn, and um, I think I connected with them through. It was a guy who lived across the street, DJ Rick Root. He lived on our block. I think that's how I connected with him. If I'm Where it's literally like, oh yeah, that's the producer that lives across yeah, the street. Yeah, we, we would talk. Yeah, we would talk. We would talk. Yeah. Oh no so, way. <laughs> and then I remember, went to the studio. I remember taking my uh, EPS sixteen plus to the studio. You know, it was it was, it was awesome, wow. man. Yeah, it was definitely great working with them. Yeah, just a classic sort of uh, now somewhat obscure or yeah, you know forgotten definitely. gem. Definitely. Um, yeah, I just love love that stuff from 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 that era. Um, Thanks, man. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, there's this. It, it, you're right. Like there was such a circle of people at that time, and you were really like super involved uh, yeah, with, within that community too. Like another person, I feel like it was also a very producer driven period in in New York too. Because you know, obviously DJ Spinner was another big definitely, player. You definitely. did a joint with him too. Definitely. This is all like I think between Rockus Records and Guess Wild too. Those were the two indies that. 
brought you a lot of work. Um, and um, also, um, uh, uh, Duck Down. Yes, because you, know, you did a, a number of things from um, the Coco Brothers, like well, you know, Smith Ones to some when they had a compilation, um, did some stuff on there and Illinois, Illinois, yeah, Illinois, right. yeah, yeah, and oh. um, you know, and and the great thing about that, which goes back to connective tissue, uh, Joey, the the who was that road manager who con- connected me with Khalil, she um, connected uh, me with uh, the beat miners. Oh, cool! You know, so they just became, like, hey, you guys should meet. Yeah, yeah. And 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 the family used to travel out on the bus to you know their place out in Bushwick and stuff, yeah. and just the basement. And I mean, I appreciate you know her obviously introduced me to them, but then they they really started to mentor me, like you know when you're really? young, yeah, because it was like you know we're playing stuff and and then introduced me to Baby Paul, which Baby Paul inadvertently you know he talked to them about and that's how i think i st- began to work with help skelter because he did the love for all the fire scorch guy right you know so then it's just how it's so beautiful how it just things just look connect you know yeah 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 it's yeah. crazy you do have a lot of history with boot camp yeah yeah yeah, so I, I, yeah. I used to live on knickerbocker avenue for like 10 years mm-hmm. um and that's where mr walton and them live right. on down knickerbocker right. so uh, even you know when I had my label, I did a re- I did two albums with Sadat X, and there was one. Mr. Walt did a song on uh, on this on the second one on the second album we did was called Black October, and I remember very vividly to get the master. We had to meet up before he took his daughter to school mm. in the park. We met up at like six a.m. in the park. Right. Uh, like there's like they live across the street from this right, little right, right. kind of yeah. dingy park in, yeah. in the middle of Bushwick to get it was a CDR master too, right. but. Yeah, those guys are amazing. Just another Definitely. great, like, um, you know, facet of that uh, New York producer world. Definitely. Um, and then, of course, I mean, I think someone that was, I would like to think was like your contemporary, although I don't know if you guys ever had a relationship with JD. I mean, you Definitely. obviously must have moved Definitely. in similar circles, right? Definitely. And, and interestingly, um, he came to New York. I was already in New York and working, but... <clears throat> He was already making inroads, let's say with the Q tips or whatever. So, and obviously most they had relationships with them too, right? In the day laws or whatever. So, um, I remember, and and this is this is where this is probably one of the first times I felt like jealous, man. I was like, and and not so much that that production wise we could, you know, he had his, I had mine, it's fine. But I remember most, you know, I felt like we had been working together, and it's like, you know. And I'm like, man, it's good. Let's let's go, let's go. And then uh, he came, he came over my house and he was playing the JD and he was just going off. It's like, <laughs> oh, oh. And I and I remember feeling like, dang, man, who is this guy? You know what I mean? <laughs> right. So, um, and then you hearing him, uh, and then also too, he did some things on Mad Skills album. So he that's did, right. Yeah. So we really paralleled, you know, each other and stuff like that. So I only met him one time. You really. Know, one time we were at Battery Studios, and I know he probably thought this was super weird, you know what I mean? But I said, man, I said, you know, um, you know, obviously you don't know this, man, but I just said, man, you know, I was, you know, working and stuff, and man, then you came on the scene, man, and these guys are all excited about you, man. And I said, man, I apologize, man. I just, I felt jealous, man. I, I, dude, I know he probably thought it was like, this is what guys talking about, you know what I mean? But he, he knew the work I was doing and stuff too, so you know, it was, it was mutual respect, but. It was he was the one, he was the one that made. I guess because probably you know I was most and I was so close working together. And just, yeah. But but he made me. You know he he definitely pushed me. You know what I mean. And and made and ultimately made me better, man. I mean you know it's right. like and that's what it's about. You know what I mean it just you hear something it's just like, oh, oh I have to go I have to go you know and not copy because it's just you know it's about you know just push yourself. Right. I mean, stylistically, you guys are very different, yeah. you know, um, but I think probably because of that, and I, you, you never know, you, he, you, he probably was feeling, you know, this, um, it was a mutual feeling, like, obviously, Sean J. Period has some incredible music, and we're on some of the same albums, right. he is hearing it, and some of those records are very big, so, you know, it, it could have easily also pushed him yeah, as it's, well. It's potential. Know? But it's interesting you mentioned that, and I'm going to kind of bring it to the current, and then we'll go back to it. Yeah, for sure. Um, one of the things I'm doing now is, um, you know, because everybody's doing like kind of the sound kits and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, um, uh, Illmind and I, 
uh, we have some mutual uh, business relationships. And they kind of, you know, I've been seeing it going on and stuff like that. And they brought it to my attention. It was like, yeah, you need to check this out. You know what I mean? Just see what you think. So um, in the process, I'm watching, you know, kind of studying everything. And different people started releasing um, the drum kits and different sound sound samples. Right, yeah, stuff. I've been noticing that. Yeah. yeah. So I just I came up with an idea. And that's actually what the shirt is. Um, okay. You know, uh, drum stacks, you know. And basically, it's this is my initial offering, and it's going to be uh, in the beginning of February. And so it's, um, you know, uh, let's say actual organic sounds or whatever. But then instead of it just being a kick or whatever, you know, an EQ and stuff like that, um, it will be, you know, let's say me hitting on a stop sign with a, on, um, a metal pole or whatever, like getting right. so blending tones, you know, on top of that stuff. Yeah, EQ atmospheric and, stuff. Right. right. But no, but it's hits, like drum kicks. Oh, it's all kicks. Yeah, yeah, kicks okay, it's all percussive stuff, right. stuff. All right. for the drum stacks thing. But I say that to say that one of the things, um, I met my Dukes. I, she and I uh, judged a contest together a little bit over a year ago. Oh, wow. Uh, down in Virginia uh, with this group called the Beat Conductors. Um, okay. DJ Olo, he, he can, I went down there a few times, but uh, he was there. I mean, she was there judging. You know, it was um, DJ Revolution and DJ Tony Touch, um, she and myself. And so uh, her husband, Tony Smith, runs the Jay Della Foundation, mm -hmm. you know. So one of the things that I'm doing is the, um, with, let's say, the drum sacks for initial, you know, I'm talking to them about the specific amounts or whatever like that. But when what I What do you mean by amounts? Like the different... money, money. I'm actually going to donate okay. part of my, the proceeds, you know, like let's say $5 off of what I'm doing. Because this, right. this, the drum stack is not, you're not buying individual kits. It's more of a um, calendar year membership. Gotcha. You know what I mean? So it's not like having to convince somebody to buy this one, buy this it's a one. subscription. Yeah, you know what I mean. So, um, so, but part of what I'm gonna do is, and to honor, obviously, because he and I are contemporaries, and I didn't really fully see it until like you know past year or so. But I think it will be good one to you know pay homage to his legacy. You know what I mean. Obviously, the foundation helps his family some, and you know whatever sure. like that. You know what I mean. So. But anyway, I just just brought it up since you mentioned. No, no, it's Bella. interesting. So, yeah, so yeah. it's so it would be um, so people can buy like uh, a, it would there would be one flat fee, I suppose. Yeah, and then doing like, a flat fee because I see the business model selling. I'm seeing you know so many people in the market selling kits and stuff. Right. That is just driving everybody to you know almost fire sale ask kind of thing. you know what I mean where they you see yeah. them offering thirty dollars but then it's like thirty percent discount. Like, you know what I mean? It's the software market as a whole is competitive in no matter right. what you're doing. Right. So I just I, I really I had I had a failed subscription site some years ago, but you know, God it brought back to my remembrance, you know, that the things I've learned in it and it's just it's a good model, you know what I mean? To where Yeah, absolutely. So that people are only paying um uh so fifty nine dollars it's calendar year. It's not based upon year you sign up. So everybody right. gets the same amount same material right. you know it's like 200 sounds for january which i'm it's going to start, even on launching in february it's going to be um 200 and then it's 100 100 you know and, and it pieces out you 100 know, each like, month after that 100 not 100 dollars 100 sounds yeah i'm saying though yeah so do you already have all that material working on it right now <laughs> that's man. a lot of material i'm working on it hard man hard so it's original drum sounds as well as just a range of percussive type yeah, it's all, all original. Everything I'm stacking, I'm putting, you know. Right. So it is, and I remember I told 88 Keys, I said, but the idea of what I was doing, you know. And he was like, man, sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, so, sometimes a lot of work, you know, it could really pay off, too. Yeah. You know? I, I think mean, it's cool. But for the price I'm, I'm coming in at, you know what I mean? And it's it's like, obviously, you know, if a good amount of people get it, it's, you know, it does well. Right. You know what I mean? But, you know, it, it I felt I had to do it that way. It's just that way you you're not... Trying to just oh bye bye and then I can right. be as benevolent as I want to. I'm I'm working on other sound stuff. Yeah, here you go and you know, contest and things like that. Right, know, so, right, right. So it's cool. Yeah, I think the subscription thing is a great segue into just talking about what you've been up to recently and um, and I feel like in regards to that too. I think I think I don't know what the best way to phrase this is. I feel like. Um, there was like maybe some unfair reporting or misreporting on like, uh, or maybe also coupled with a little too much emphasis on like this on the whole sampling thing okay, with you, okay. 
where it was like it became too easy of a story to affiliate with you. You know what I mean? Definitely. Where and this is obviously old news no, now. No, but I, yeah, sure. Where it'd be like you know, dude, he, he quit sampling. You know, like right. why? But at the same time, it's that's not like. You know, there's a lot of incredible producers that don't sample at all. Right, so right, right, right. I just wanted to even if to look back at that period of time and not to pick it apart or anything like mm-hmm. that. But it's but it Definitely. is like a piece of your history as, as a producer. Definitely. Like, do you feel that like in this also isn't like a tra- I'm not trying to turn this into like a traditional interview by any Definitely. means, too. Definitely. But I've always been curious about it, too, because you haven't really been in the press uh, talking about it. Yeah. 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 How did how, like. Obviously, there was people probably asked you a lot about it mm-hmm. in the moment, like in Definitely. the early 2000s, I think was like really the, the period of time Definitely. where it became more of a of a fixation for fans or the collectors. Sure, sure. Or, you know, what was the how did that feel then as compared to now that you've been able to kind of get situated mm-hmm. in, into into uh, into what, you know, your sound, what your sound is now? I mean, obviously. Um, I have to think. I mean, the timing was, you know, sampling was obviously, and still is, you know, a significant part of hip hop. And in in doing the samples, you know, sample clearance people, they, it was about the hiding of, you know, how can I, unless it was a, a, a totally, you know, a loop and whatever, you're trying to do obscure, particularly that's jazz became big because it's obscure. Right. So you could pull different pieces and put it to effects and do, you know, whatever you filter, whatever. Flip it. And, yeah, basically flip it. So the thing that, and I was doing it, you know, and but then I was also playing at the same time. I was playing Rose on the thing. With right. It, you know, so I was always doing both. And uh, initially it started with my lawyer at the time, who my lawyer came out of television. So okay. my lawyer, she was just like, yeah, you know. Sean, you need to, you know, think about not sampling, you know what I mean? Because mm. TV, you know, they, they absolutely don't want it unless they, you know, they, they don't because they're exposed all the time, you know what sure. I mean? So that was the seed. And then I remember, you know, as I was growing as a Christian uh, in my relationship uh, with Jesus and stuff, I read, said, let him who stole steal no more, but let him be productive with his hands that he may have to give to those in need. And I just remember it just hit me like a rock i was like oh man you know because I, I was i mean i was you know taking this little piece and, and i i wasn't looking to say i was you know eight seven eight records this little pieces and right. you know, stuff like that and that was the part that the conviction where i was like and i'm already playing and i'm like and i just wrestled with that whole thing so really those two things were the two events that were pretty significant in that process very difficult because most and I have been working on a lot of songs, you know, and I had songs when I made that decision, you know, that I said, I can't release. I don't know where I got the stuff from, man. You know, and I saw him, I saw him on the street maybe a year and a couple of years back. And every time I see him, you know, he'll, hey, brother. Yeah, man, I was thinking about that song. I'm like, he <laughs> still constantly, thinking about constantly, he'll mention different songs that we had worked on. And but I mean, you have to admit the material you guys did was like m- m- very impactful music. Sure, I mean soulful, beautiful music that you know. Yeah. But I mean, it's just he and see. I mean, I appreciate that because you're observing it. But this is like this is my friend, right? right? And I'm like, we're we're wrestling. We're both going through our own spiritual process. You know what I mean? Because on on the uh, Universal Magnetic, he he must have read a he read a book and was talking about how horns you know, evoke certain spirits and um, string instruments or whatever. So even Universal Magnetic and even um, uh, Children's Story, they weren't, the, the sa- actual sounds that I use were not the sounds that would end up being on there. It was like, let's say, let's say example, the um, I use the Rhodes, you know, on, on actually on both of them because the Rhodes plays a low note that's kind of bass, right. you know, oriented. And but let's say Universal Magnetic, it had um, it had a bass guitar, but I ended up using like some rubber band and I mic'd it really. I just was doing some crazy stuff to try to honor my friend, you know what I mean, whom I love. And I'm like, this is your path and this is my path. And we had to go through, you know, um, allowing each other to be where we were. You know what I mean? Right. So that's the general 
uh, sampling story. You know, that that was why, you know. It's a trip because uh, children's story is like a song about sampling, too, when you listen yeah, to his yeah, lyrics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, you know, you're coming out of that era that was the, the bad boy um, era of, like, taking the whole police song for... Mm you know, I miss Big Pop or taking right. like the the Bowie record or like these right. things that are really taking someone's whole original composition from start to finish or, you know, 32 bars of it or right. whatever. But even, even let's say, because a bulk of us from the Dillas to the Wit Tribe, everybody came out of a camp. Right. You know what I mean? I'm definitely out of the, I, mean, I listen to the Daylights and all this stuff, but everybody kind of picked up, but I'm definitely out of the Tribe camp. And you look at Tribe stuff. It's a lot of samples in there. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Yeah. So we all just, and, and these were the records that people played, you know, our parents played you right, know, in the house. Right. We, we grew up, this stuff was getting in us. So you look at a Puffy, you know, and people are like, oh, Puffy, why are you sampling this stuff? But if he grew up listening to it, it's like it's in him. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Just, so, you know, we can look back on it now, but people are like, oh, you know, you're selling out, you, right. you know, whatever, whatever. But, you know, ultimately to that end, I had to fight in myself to like, man, okay, my sound sources are gone. And that's why I really stopped producing for a while because I'm like, if, I, if I'm if i not sampling and I only have a couple of keyboards, well, what am I doing? And I had to go through this whole process of, you know, then starting to use sound modules and stuff, which the sounds were more R&B. It was just like, I was just struggling for a while. Right, right. And eventually with the advent of like the digital um, workstations and virtual instruments and stuff, and I just learned right. better en- engineering techniques I was able to do a lot of stuff. Like well, my stuff now I feel really good about, you know what I mean? But it took a long time, you know, to do it. But that very, I guess, reputation has helped me because now, like, through uh, my music publishing and stuff, like, people come to me. Like, I've had opportunities given to me where, you know, I need we need to submit this for a television show or some type of, you know, um, right. uh, visual uh, presentation. And where the original song had samples of, they give me the acapellas to say, you know, do... So it's become a thing where this guy can give us the sound and not sample. You know what I mean? So right. it's it's work for me now. Sure. You know? Well, at, yeah. You can't use samples at all yeah, for that. You know? So at at the time, it was super difficult, man. You know what I mean? People don't realize how, you, you know, you're used to producing. All of a sudden, it was just like your sound sources are gone. Right. And you're having to fit... And you don't like... The sources that you presently have, it's yeah. not inspiring. Right, records weren't inspiring. See, that's the thing. You could you could go um, digging for a record, or just find some some little thing on a record and just inspire you. Absolutely. And if, yeah. and if your sounds are not inspiring you, man, it's very difficult. Yeah, you know? yeah, that's got to be such a complicated position to be in mm-hmm. too. Do you did you keep the samplers? Did you keep the records? Like, do you use samplers? Do you sample your own? Um, stuff? I do a little bit, but I was with the digital stuff now. You can, you know, but I still have the um, uh, the EPS sixteen plus, and one of the worst trades I ever made. But uh, my friend Fred traded me because I wanted to do more videos and stuff like right. that. I traded him for a camera, and the camera we did did okay. But I traded my SP twelve hundred, man. Damn. Yeah. But the thing about it is, I mean, it was sitting around for years, and then what you right. don't value, you will lose. Either you give it up, or it will be taken from you, one of the two mm. you know so from that perspective perspective you know i was just like i, I didn't value it i was like yeah it's just sitting around right and then after he got him like and I, and I made sure it was good for him you know change the hard drive there's something that that would need to do but he loves it he he's such a i mean he's the perfect person to have it right he's still he, using he it. babies that thing like right. you know what i mean but i told him i said man let me tell you right now we could be 85 years old my man and you you want to get rid of this? It comes back to me. Nice, yeah. you know. But it, the originally that actually came from I, I purchased it off of uh, Vic um, from the beat from the beat nuts, beat nuts, yeah. yeah. So wow. so it has some history, you know what I mean? Absolutely. So, but from that from that, you know, it was it, I look back on it and I'm like, man, it was a good move ultimately for me to make with the, with the whole sampling thing. But like I say, it was just difficult, you know. And now. A lot of guys don't do it. Some people, but you know, because yeah. you get hip seed from a business standpoint, the publishing thing, right? You know, a lot of guys just like you know all those records that we love. Those artists weren't making the money on it, man. Right, you right. Know what I mean, so 
you know, now. Well, this wisdom life that that was that was not a lot. There were no, no, there was no sample. I was already, yeah. yeah. But that see, that was starting to find my way, right? You know what I mean. But and that that probably was one of the records that really I'm gonna tell you the record that that for me showed me it was a glimpse, but it wasn't it wasn't the full manifestation. Was um, Frontline, which was yes, Elder Sense, right? And Mon, Pharrell, and, and, yeah. and FT, and um, classic, Mike Zoot. yeah, Mike Zoo, yeah, classic Guess Wild, yeah. record, yes, that was the first, that was the first dun, record, dun, dun, dun. Yep. yeah, yep. that I didn't, that I took, let's say, like it was just a horn swell. I got off, like you can buy the CDs, you know, that had horn players playing, right? Sound design stuff, and and I just took it and I um, played almost like a chord, but I would let it swell, you know, and then doing effects or whatever. But that was the first record that I ever felt good. Like, man, okay, I, I could do this. I, I, you know. Yeah. And it's funny enough, that record, I had a guy who, who goes around, I don't even know what company, like, wanted to try to sue me, like, saying that I, I took a sample from it. I was oh like, oh, my gosh, really? What? Dude. Of all the records. Of all right? the records. <laughs> you going to come to me now? Right. You know what I mean? So then, so, I, you know, I, um, it was bogus in my whole life, my lawyer went through, but I, I broke it apart. It's like I took this note, this note, and this, and you know it went away. But I was just like, "Wow, how ironic!" You After know all I mean? that. Yeah, you know what I mean. But you know, but anyways, it, it was it was good though. Yeah, I think Sorry. yeah, definitely. You know, I love I love uh, I love that record. I remember that's when I first moved to New York was that summer is when that came out because I remember Matt gave me a, a tape with that was that was on it and some of his joints that he was rhyming on when he was yeah. when he was uh, exploring rhyming and he stuff like that. He, yeah. He's in the studio the other day. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> yes. So I just, we don't have to go too deep on it because we already covered so much from the past, but the stuff with Guess Wild because that's a label that, you know, I met Matt like when he was still fingertip and I, you know, I wasn't, I didn't grow up in New York, so I like really like uh, um, met, got to know him after some of the records had come out. But I mean, um, you know, the stuff that he was doing with Mike Zoot was just, mm-hmm. you know, it was just so dope. Mm-hmm. It felt like, yeah, you know, definitely, definitely. what I never had an opportunity to meet Mike, but you've done, you've done a handful of yeah, records yeah, with him. What's definitely. he like? Mike is great. Uh, when I met Mike first, um, I don't even remember the song, man. All in it? No, no, no. What's that one? It was, a, it was, a, it was, a, it was a, whatever a song it was. You had the incredible one on the Lyricist Lounge record. It was all on my own, I think. Yeah, I did that one, but it was, was that the first? But, but you had to, um, I think that was the first one I did with him. If I high drama part three. Yeah, the high drama and stuff with and it had the consequence on the different people. Oh, it. you did the original high drama yeah, as well. A couple yeah. of them. Yes. You know what I mean? Oh, there's three versions yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah. So so it was cool. But but um That first high drama was a classic. Yeah. I do I have to remember back. I have to go listen to a lot of this. And you too. that's a that's another thing when well, it comes Mike, to this. Mike is great. So to answer your question, Mike All right, is great. Cool. I mean such an incredible lyricist. I think he was like totally ahead of his time. Criminally slept on, you know. I think he could keep pound for pound him and most stuff. I mean, I feel like he he could he could have had the same career trajectory. Yeah. I don't know what happened to him. If he happens to be listening to this for whatever reason, I'm a big fan of his. I think he's dope. I love this. The records you guys did together were yeah. cool because he was such a he was like Slick Rick. He had just like a yeah, crazy yeah, weird imagination, definitely, you know. Definitely. Um, but can you do you can you go back to those records that you did at that time and? And appreciate them, even though oh, it's definitely. you know you're chopping, flipping samples and stuff like that. Definitely, and and I, I also in the whole process, I learned that you, you, I mean sampling aside, you know, right. when, when you think about just even someone taking it and chopping and doing whatever, you actually put even if you your your sources were you know from the from the sampling you know from the record like that, you took them and flipped them and made them into something that didn't exist. Yes. So you put your creativity in it. Your sound source just was this instead of a keyboard. You know what I mean? And I right. couldn't understand over over the time. But I totally can appreciate, you know, some of the stuff when I look back on it, I'm like, man, you know, like I, I, I see that I feel like I'm good. You know what I mean? You have to at least give true assessment to yourself. You know what I mean? Some people Absolutely. don't know how to judge themselves. You know what I mean? But I feel right. like I'm nowhere near where I can be. You know what I mean? And it's like, and, and, I appreciate that pre- people appreciate it, you know what I mean. But it's like I just have to stay hungry and you know so what I'm doing, sure. you know. But um, but I can appreciate it, man. I, I just and I listen back to it and just remember a lot of how the stuff even came about, 
I'm you know? sure every song probably has some yeah. crazy story with yeah, Just it you mentioning stuff to me, it has me like thinking. I, I just remember vividly, you know, where we were, what you know what I mean? And that's that's what life does, you know what I mean? So, right. And I think that does play back to that era too when uh, you know, computers weren't as accessible as far as sending tracks to one another. You physically had to go up into a studio in Manhattan yeah. or you demoed it out in your crib on a four track or eight track or whatever. Definitely. And you go to some nice studio in Manhattan, some labels paying Definitely. for or something Definitely. like that. And uh, and then you never know who's up in there mm-hmm. too. And uh, there's always like you know other extra people in the studio. I'm sure yeah. it's certain there was certain artists that didn't even get on tracks that were there yeah, and stuff. You know? um, so just that you even have that. I mean, your music is incredible and will stand the test of time. Absolutely. And uh, absolutely, um, but that you have all these like really priceless memories of of that era because it kind of was like the last great era before. Mm-hmm. Um, I think computers, uh, you, you know, the evolution of that technology mm-hmm. just shifted uh, home studio recording, right, right. you know. Um, but I can say that I appreciate you doing this because oftentimes you don't, I mean, you, you live your life, man, and you make you make new memories and unless things bring you back, right? you know. Like I remember um, I was traveling up that when I talked about so actually I'm, I'm sorry I didn't even remember the Blacksburg thing I should have known that because it's near Bristol. What's right. what, James Madison is in what Harrisonburg? Harrisonburg, right, Virginia. Right, right. That's north, so, a little bit north, right. but it's on eighty one. So, right. Still, yeah. I was traveling on eighty one um, last year. Okay. And just you know just driving and and when I said a cattle on a thousand hills, that's that is the truth. It's just hills and cow i'm like dude where you know what i mean right so but but the interesting thing is i was driving and it was just such a reflective trip you know um that i was having some things i found out like some some uh some of my lineage you from being from tennessee and you know so i was driving back and i was driving through harrisonburg and i remembered man i remember that the eps 16 plus which i still have that I, that i produced the lyric contestant on that uh-huh, right. the most stuff stuff was produced on that the artifacts that was produced on all the stuff was purchased from a music store in Harrisonburg. No way. That my cousin uh, Jeremy and I, we you know when when colleges flood you with credit cards, you know get try to get you hooked. Right. If they did, you'd be hooked at the time, you know. <laughs> right. um, and but we used that credit card to buy the EPS sixteen plus, which wow. made all of that stuff. And it was just such a like. A moment, man. But I would have never thought about that had I not traveled that way. It was just so deep in the recesses. Sure. And that's what I, you, it's great what you're doing because, you know, if, if this, I'm assuming that this is your style of, of your, the podcast. Absolutely. Doing, yeah. You know? It's pretty much always yeah. like this. Yeah. Because it, it's, it's bringing people, bringing things up, you know what I mean? That are there, but are just, you know, just laid dormant. You know, right. so it's awesome. I really appreciate it. Man. Oh, I, I appreciate it too. Yeah. What? So, what even? Uh, what took you to Harrisonburg in the first place to buy Just, the sampler? Um, I mean, why that? Calling time? around because they didn't have it. We were looking. You know, I guess you look around and did we spec one in Richmond? Um, is this a call? This is a college town. Yeah, know? but but this store, whatever it was, like we found out maybe we saw someone with it or something like that. And we were like, yeah, and they didn't have an enrichment. The price wasn't right. as good as the one in Harrisonburg. That's ultimately price drives, you know. Yeah. So I think it was probably the best price. And, you know, he was willing to work with us, and we went and got it. And it's amazing. Yeah. You Simple know I mean? as that. Yeah. And all these incredible records yeah. were yeah. just because that was your piece of machinery that you used. Yeah. And that's great that you still have it, too. Yeah. I, do you ever you ever I turn it on? fired up, though. Now, now that I'm doing all the like the, the drum stack stuff or whatever and just... Yeah, like, for drum programming? You know, right. Or just yeah. even to use it as the 12... I think it's 12-bit. But, you know what I mean? It's just use it as, as a sound source. You know what I mean? But right. I, I still have disc with songs on it. Now, right. I, I've always thought, man, in some of this stuff, I'm like, if I could figure out from the, the line of demarcation when I stop sampling... To if I can figure that out, I will resurrect some of that stuff. And, you know yeah. what I mean. So, but it's I just have to, but just you know, just time wise, trying to do it. Yeah, and once you open that Pandora's box, yeah, it yeah, can yeah. go so many different yeah, ways. Definitely. You know, yeah. Um, uh, one more thing before we kind of wrap things up too, and uh, you know, not to like try to pick at each individual thing sure. you did over your career, but the stuff with DJ Crush was always okay. such a cool thing. Sure. Obviously, he is like a Zen like kind of character mm-hmm. too, and doesn't speak any English. Mm-hmm. 
uh, I interviewed him like in a formal interview years ago and like you know I had the translator there yeah. like uh, I meant to ask this earlier but what was your experience with him because you have that that incredible song together but yeah. what but two is that songs, actually. yeah on two different albums right, right, right. Now was that just you doing? Not, not, I wasn't able to look at the liner notes mm -hmm. or anything. Was that you doing everything, and it's just on his album, or you guys actually uh, work together, or what? Um, both instances, we work together, and it's Connective Tissue uh, Duro had a project with them. They came to the U.S. on the first album, and um, they he was the engineer. They hired right. him to do that, so he basically pulled me in. I was working on Artifacts at the time, but he introduced me to them. And then, you know, Crush was just looking to work with different people, Fista Bundys and, right. you know, whoever. And we we hit it off, you know what I mean? And so basically, we went in the studio, and I think I came up with the drums. Drum. So we, we, we traded. So basically, so. I started out with this program, and then he'll add his part. And then I'll come and add my part. And we just went back and forth, Dope. back and forth, until we finished the song. In, on the spot, in the studio. Right. So, and then the one on the second album, the second song that we don't, I don't know, if, it wasn't the second album, but the, the, the second song, uh, they flew us to Japan, you know. Nice. To work so, out yeah, of there. Yeah, because he was out there. He did, he, they didn't weren't traveling here at the time. So, we got there to make two days really quick. Crazy jet lag. Two days, yeah. That's, yeah. that's a short trip. Crazy Japan. turbulence. <laughs> Never uh, been on a plane that shook like that, buddy. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. And those are big planes, so when the big planes go. shake. We're doing yeah. coming back. I don't know we hit the jet stream or something, buddy, but it was like, wow. Wow. Yeah. The, boom, boom, the plane yeah. was – anyway. But we did same, the same concept. So we were in a studio in Japan. Uh, Duro, had he flew out there ahead of us. And then, you know, he was working on the project with him, so he came there and met. And – same scenario. I think I came up with the drums. And, you know, so that's how we did it. But the thing I learned from Crush, because no other artist I remember, every other artist I work with speaks English. So I can right. talk to them, you know. But I learned from him that how universal music is. Because no matter if I don't understand that you could be articulating something with your words, I don't understand you. You don't understand me. a little, Maybe a little bit. And right. I would learn words from, let's say, Mommy, his, you know, who worked with him and stuff. In the Rico, um, to kind of you know, to show honor to him, you know, but we were hearing the same. We were able to work on the song because we were hearing the same language, right. you know. And that's the beautiful thing about music, you know. And no matter what happens to music, uh, no matter how, um, you know, the, the digitization of music and all of these different things, you know, it still translates, man. You know what I mean? Mm. So. It, it's, it's just such a beautiful thing to think that, you know, the things you do could go around the world, you know, and be heard. It's, it's awesome, man. You know? Yeah, you can be so far away from home and in a studio mm -hmm. and and few people speak your language and be right. able to connect and make music that then can be come out and people buy and like really, you know, Definitely. love and listen to. I mean, uh, yeah, that's a beautiful thing. That might be even a good uh, stopping point, too, right. man. I mean, I really appreciate your time so Thank much. It was so definitely much, an man. honor. Thank you, man. And after all the years, this being like actually the first time we yes. finally actually meet is quite a trip, too. So thanks yes. again, man. Appreciate Thank you. it.